Hey guys, it's Audio Energy Time again. I'm Shannon, and today we're going to be looking or starting a new series on room sound and getting your room right. So let's get into it. Okay, um, first of all, before we get into our subject today, just want to say sorry I didn't put one up uh, last week, a video on our thing last week. Uh, I do some traveling to Melbourne sometimes, I've got some family down there, and um, there's a few things going on that I need to uh, sort of keep on track. So um, while I'm down there, I'm also looking at some other opportunities, which I might mention a little bit later on. Uh, I just have to get some things going first, because I'm looking at some business opportunities down there that I think might be advantageous in my future. But for now, um, just want to basically make an announcement that I'll be looking at getting some uh, business ideas integrating with audio energy, uh, which include retail. So I'm looking into that, uh, and I'll be doing it online, mainly serving probably Australia, depending on where I can ship to, and um, but I would like to expand it out. And so the benefit of having a retail business run by an engineer is that you get the benefit of uh, knowing that the products that I've chosen um, are going to be based on someone who understands how to get the best out of those instruments and those, those tools, as well as just basically making selections on products that I think are really good and some that um, might just be convenient for you. So if you're a filmmaker, you're a DJ, you're a music maker, you're a content creator, if you're an engineer, if you just love music, I'm going to try and get a number of products on there um, for you, and I'll look at getting that going probably in the next few months. So it's still a little bit away yet, but that's what I'd like to do, and that's where my focus is going. So anyway, let's get into today's subject, and today's subject is uh, basically room types for sound. And I'm going to focus on um, the, you know, the, the type of room tones and the, and the problems and things that can occur when you're looking at either setting up a studio or uh, just you know, a small, small scale studio. If you're doing a large studio, you'll get an acoustician um, who will basically be able to help you set everything up properly and, and build for you. But at the moment, my target is helping all of you who maybe have um, ideas for a smaller studio or are working in a, a small room in your house or a medium sized room in your house and you're, you, you've got your speakers in there and you've set everything up it's going good but it probably doesn't sound quite right um, it's something that you can't really tell first up but and it's not until you start really learning to hear your mixes in other environments that you'll notice that it'll change so our goal is to try and find a standardized um, environment for you to mix in. Um, now that can change a little bit, but over the many decades uh, there's basically been um, a big attempt to try and find something that's standardized, a room that's standardized uh, across the board. And so the first thing we're going to look at and discuss with that is uh, the room sounds, okay, and the types of room. So generally there's your standard room, what they would consider a standard room. Um, and that would basically be a 6.5 by 4.5 by 2.8 meter uh, room that you're working in. Okay, it's a rectangular room. Most rooms are rectangular. If you're working in a bedroom or uh, maybe a, s a medium sized room, it's most likely going to be rectangular. Okay, now there's a whole lot of information, a whole lot of debates around what can happen in these types of rooms uh, and how these rooms can make your music and your mixes sound. Okay. Um, but nine times out of ten, the room you're going to get is going to be rectangular. So how can you really modify that if it's you know, a bedroom or, or just a rented room or something like this? So we're going to look about that, and I'm going to do this series probably over two or three, maybe more. Depends how it go. It's just that this can be quite intensive with information. So essentially, this whole thing is about minimizing your reflections in your room. Okay, um, so. I've mentioned the standard room, and that's a room that most of us usually work in. Uh, the second room is a reflection-free zone, and that's essentially like an anechoic chamber, or it could be something where you've really worked to reduce the reflections all around uh, your environment. Now, it's not always... Uh, a lot of people like this one because I think it's just going to give you a, a basic flat sound, but it actually doesn't. It tends to take away... Um, a lot of the qualities of the natural acoustics of your room and of the acoustics of the sound that's coming through as well. So 
and the sound that you have to work with. So if you're going to do a reflection-free zone, there's certain ways that you can design it, um, but realize uh, it's going to take probably a fair bit of um, diffusion and diffraction tools to do that, especially when you're working with uh, low frequencies, because as frequencies change uh, across the spectrum in both time and, and the frequency itself, um, the wavelength is changing, okay? So when you're working with low frequencies, uh, they are, especially under 100 hertz, as I've probably said before, they're omnipresent, okay? So they, they spread out in all directions equally, okay? Um, and they move around objects and things in a different way. So to try and reduce resonances of low frequencies, you need um, absorption that is quite thick and quite large compared to higher frequencies, okay? Uh, if you had a very low frequency of, say, 10 hertz or 5 hertz or something you can generally you generally have to need to really absorb that you need up to about a two meter thick concrete wall uh, and then another one outside of that uh, and some some um, treating qualities in between those walls and things so you need a lot and that's it's essentially impractical to have a wall that size so uh, there are other ways to do it um, and but you don't really want to lose too much too quickly okay the other uh, room is a LEDE, which is live end, dead end. Okay, now essentially that means that the front of your room and the area around your monitors and where you're working is very flat and very dead. You want that absorbent uh, and very non-reflective. And as it moves towards the back of the room, you increase the um, reflective qualities of the room. Okay, this can be done in bedrooms, but um, you know you generally need a, a, a bit of a longer room, a bit more space to do it effectively. But look, it can be done anywhere. Okay. Now, some of the problems that have been encountered over the decades while they were doing these things was, um, yeah, there might be too, the response they get in the room in the monitoring room we're talking about might be too flat. It might be too reflective. Um, so there was a couple of different ideas that came up and the BBC came up with one idea and I'll share this quickly. Um, essentially what they did was uh, try to keep, because their problem was it was broadcasting and broadcasting creates a whole lot of different um, issues and problems from regular type of recording, studio recording, things like that. So they tried to have a goal where each time they would send, because they had a lot of different places that they would send their production people to, to do different productions. So they wanted to make sure all the rooms were, were generally equal. Um, and when they sent their, their signal out, the person receiving it through the TV or the radio, uh, everyone would pretty much be hearing that equally. Because if you had one room where the voice people were, uh, doing a broadcast and another room where uh, perhaps a live orchestra was recording the background music, if they were clashing too much and, and, and there was too much uh, difference between uh, good flat response and, and the nice acoustics of that chamber where the, the orchestra was, uh, it would really come out quite messy. So they had to try and focus on that. Um, and what they found was they wanted to try and leave the room as natural as possible but just try and reduce some of the, um, the general uh, reflections and reverb uh, within the room, uh, getting it under a certain sound limit, which is usually about 0 0.4 milliseconds, right? Or, yeah, 0 0.4 milliseconds, 0 0.4 milliseconds. Um, that was kind of the ideal that they came up with. They didn't want anything reflecting too much after that because then it would start to build up other problems, okay? Along the chain, uh, there was another one that came up, which was called the hybrid room, and that was basically a mixture of anechoic, which is a heavily absorbent, non-reflective room, and they would mix that with the traditional uh, standard room or the reflective room. Um, but it was they found that it was very hard to control, and they had to really do a lot of different kind of jagged edges and things to break up the sound and to um, send the the traveling pathways of sound uh, into different directions and eventually send it into um, absorption uh, catches basically called diffusion um, where a lot of that energy would just dissipate and go away. So they were trying to maintain the um, natural reverber reverberant acoustics 
and have it quite suppressed as well. So they did come up with some ideas for that. Um, it just made it quite difficult and quite expensive. Okay, now given all this information, what does that mean for your room and my room? Uh, well, it basically means what you want to do is work on a model that essentially reduces the amount of um, longer reflections, okay? And I'm going to explain that very shortly. So uh, you can use, if you have a carpeted floor, that's pretty good. Um, if you don't have a carpeted floor, then what you would do would be, you know, set up some carpet or some matting around the area that you work. You would um, keep the speakers off the walls a little bit and maybe put some very mild sort of uh, diffusion behind that. You can even use uh, diffusion on ceilings and things like that as well and down the side walls. It can just be things as basic as some curtains because uh, they're material, they can break things up a little bit given their, their shape and that. Um, and there's, and look, we'll get into all of that a little bit more later, but for today I just want to explain how the sound's moving and how it's traveling. Okay, so what we'll do, I'd like to go to the next issue which uh, we'll discuss and it's about modes now if you don't know what modes are modes are essentially uh, pathways of sound uh, that allow the sound to travel in all directions okay um, so modes include resonance and points of cancellation within a room so essentially when you have a speaker and it's sending out music okay that music is the further it has to travel, the broader it's getting, especially depending on the frequencies. Um, if it's a higher frequency over a short amount of time, you're going to start to lose some of that higher, sharper quality. Okay, if it's a lower sound, it's going to travel further and take a little bit longer to dissipate um, with the with the energy that it's dissipating at. And uh, so you're going to get a little bit of a change in the quality of sound from listening at a meter away from your speakers compared to three meters away from your speakers at the back of the room. Okay, so let's get into this a little bit. I've just got some notes here I'll, I'll explain to you. So if the source, uh, let's see, uh, so the pathways of sound travel in all directions. If the source is then interrupted, some energy is dissipated and trapped and uh, in repetitive pathways of the standing waves and their associated resonances are called Egan tones, okay, which is the room's own frequencies, the room, the frequencies of that sound created by the room, okay, um, which are natural room resonant frequencies. Okay, so what does all that mean? Um, essentially, the sound, as I mentioned before, is traveling in specific directions, okay, and as all that sound is traveling in, in directions, it'll hit surfaces and ref start to reflect back, okay. As it's reflecting back, once it's reflected off those those surfaces and is reflecting back, it then is resonating from the room's natural um, resonances given the surface of your walls. So it might be a gyp rock, or a, what do you guys call it? Oh, I forget what they call it in America. Um, gyp rock, anyway. Um, if you have concrete walls, it's going to give a slightly different effect and you may get even more reflection because concrete has a different uh, absorption rate okay, to um, drywall, that's what it's called, or gyp rock, okay. So each different type of wall that you have in your house, depending on what your wall's made out of, whether it's wood or concrete or um, drywall or gyp rock, each surface and the material that the surface is made out of is going to give a different response and a different resonance to the sound in the room, okay. And the, the quality of your absorption of your wall is called an absorption coefficient. You can find them out, but they're very small. And it basically affects the tonality and, and, and the, the frequency of the sounds in your room. Okay? So I, I hope I'm making sense here because this is pretty heavy stuff, uh, and I'm trying to explain it as best I can uh, without getting scientific and technical. Uh, because working these things out, there's a lot of weird math involved in the algebra and stuff. So... Um, so when the sound comes out, that's your natural acoustic sound, okay, when it hits the walls and come, starts to come back and travel in new pathways, it's then called room resonance, okay? Now, the non-resonant pathways uh, driven by, from the sound source are called forced modes, so that's a sound that's coming straight from your speakers, they're forced modes, okay? And the pathways that continue to decay after the original sound source has ended 
uh, are called resonant modes, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. The resonant modes. It's essentially that that reflection time, okay? And the reflections, the, the modes of energy that are hanging around in the room. But these sounds are actually occurring whether the sound stops or not. If the sound's still occurring, you can have a build-up of resonance in your room and it can start to make things sound muddy, it can make it sound difficult to hear, you can lose quality. Even though your ears aren't completely picking it all up, it is there and it'll be in the recording, okay? Um, and other people will hear that in your production. So, um, the sounds that are moving around there and the, those resonant modes um, can really change the quality of, of the sound and it's being caused by the mixture of sound coming from the source, so your speakers, and mixing with the sound coming from the walls back into the original source sound, okay? And so they're mixing together and at certain frequencies you'll get, um, and usually towards the center of the room, maybe the, the, sort of just behind the center of the room, about, this, about that area, uh, you'll have a, a peak of resonance in that area, okay? And that can discolor uh, your mix and make things sound a bit awkward. Um, so the, the way to do it is, this is why we treat rooms, is because if you're in a normal reflective room, you would get a little bit of reverb time that you would start to notice. And you would also get, um, you get the fall off, you get the resonance, uh, the resonant modes and things like that. And it would all mix together and make a room sound like crap and make your mix especially sound like crap. So you want to be able to hear while you're monitoring without headphones um, because that gets rid of all those, those room modes. You're going directly into the ear, it's binaural. Um, so you want to make sure that the sound in your room that you're generating and the reflective sound, because it's okay to have some reflective sound, it's just got to mix well. Um, and so the target is, especially with like the hybrid room, and this is what we want to start looking at, um, the purpose of the hybrid room and the, all the angled walls and all that sort of thing, you'll see this in a lot of studios, I'll put up some pictures here, you will see this and the reason they do that is to basically send the reflections and the, the pathway reflections everywhere but your ears, okay? So you're, that way you're hearing the direct source and any other reflections are directed away from your ears and eventually off to uh, an area of um, absorption and diffusion within the room, okay? So what can cause these things? Okay, when sound travels from your speakers, the sound is moving in every direction, as we said before, and it can move around the corners of your studio monitors, your speakers, the equipment on your desk, if they have hard edges and things like that, the monitoring equipment, the, uh, the console, um, your body itself, um, you might have cupboards in the back, you might have some other instruments, as you can see behind me. I mean, that, that wouldn't change it too much, but it would be more things within the immediate environment. And the sound is traveling around, and as soon as it, say if it travels across the front of your speakers, once it gets to the edge, and you've got a hard edge on that, it would actually have to increase in speed and move away uh, at a faster rate. And that way you're starting to have phase problems, very mild, uh, very, very fine ones, but eventually you'll have uh, phase problems you'll have with, with your monitoring, and you'll also have um, problems with the way the sound is directing itself around the room. So, and these are noticeable too, by the way. Um, so, what we're going to do is have a look here. Now, when we're talking about a normal rectangular room, uh, you have modes, as I said before. So the resonant modes in a rectangular room are axial, so they, they are sounds that are coming off the four surfaces of your walls and then travel to the ceiling. Now there's two other types, don't really need to worry about them. One is tangential and the other is oblique, okay? Uh, oblique is where it's coming off all six surfaces all around, like if you're using surround sound um, and you're in a surround sound environment, then the sound will be traveling, definitely be traveling off all four walls, floors, ceilings, everything, chairs. And so as the, the, the sound is moving across all this equipment within your room, um, it's going to be diffracted. So it's going to break up, it's going to change. And the, the waveforms traveling across the room are changing. So you might end up with more problematic areas 
within your room, this is what it all boils down to, and eventually um, you're going to have a really, really problematic mix. So that's it for today. I'm going to talk about that because this is all stuff getting pretty heavy. Um, I'm going to do another lesson on this next week, if um, time permitting. And we'll, we'll start working through this. And I want to start looking at ways to get your room sounding better and how you can do this reasonably cheaply, or quite cheaply compared to a professional studio especially. And you'll find that when you start to place everything in the right, the right spot, and when you have ways of breaking that audio up, you're going to uh, get a better sound from your monitors, from your room, and you'll be able to get a better mix and really start to uh, perhaps feel the way that the mixes uh, should be sounding and should be moving around. Okay, so I hope that helps. A lot of this information that I've been talking about today uh, comes from a book called Recording Studios. I think it's Building Recording Studios. Uh, I can put it up, uh, a picture of it here. And there we are, that's it. And uh, that's the book there. And so I hope you have um, found this one helpful. I thought I'd do something a little bit different so we're not doing screenshots all the time every week. And uh, I'm going to follow on with this a little bit more and just start talking about room modes and room changes and setting up your room. So I hope this has been great. I hope it's been helpful. Please subscribe to my channel. Uh, it's good to see you again, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.